Hello and welcome everyone. I would love to let the David Bowie keep on playing, but it is eight o'clock and we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. So I'm going to go ahead and get today's session started. My name is Anna Volker and I'll be your host this evening. I work as the coordinator of outreach for Ohio State's Department of Astronomy and CCAP, which is our Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. And we are the ones hosting tonight's event. I am so excited to have you all here for the latest installment of our monthly movie night series, Science Fiction versus Science Fact. As I'm sure you know by now, tonight we'll be delving into the science behind the film, The Martian. I am joined by an expert team of panelists, including Dr. Barry Lyons, who is a distinguished professor of earth sciences and a geochemistry expert, Romy Rodriguez Martinez, who is a PhD student in astrophysics, specializing in exoplanets. And last but not least, Dr. Peter Ling, who is one of our professors here at OSU in the Department of Food, Agricultural, and Biological Engineering. And he also serves as a NASA XHAB advisor. So rather than tell you all about that, I'm going to go ahead and let our panelists take a few minutes just to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about what they work on and how it connects to the things you all saw in the film, The Martian. To just start things off, I'd like to, to introduce you to Dr. Barry Lyons. Well, good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Anna mentioned, I'm a geochemist, but my connection to this film is that much of my work over the last 30 years has been done in the Antarctic. And I'm very interested in the geochemistry of the Antarctic, of both its water bodies and also its soils. And as probably most of you know, the Antarctic has been used both by NASA scientists and by scientists for, supported uh, from around the world to uh, be in a physical and chemical and even a biological analogy to what the surface of Mars might be like. So that's my connection to the panel. Um, what I like most about the film was not only his... Uh, uh, his stick to and his desire to stay alive and go back to the back to earth, but riding around in his uh, in his uh, automobile with that package of, of plutonium keeping him warm. I thought that was very uh, very interesting. So I, I, I will pass the torch. Fantastic! Thank you so much. Uh, next up to introduce herself is Romy. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Romy. I am a, an astronomy grad student here at OSU. I work with Professor Scott Gowdy on detecting and on the detection and characterization of exoplanets. And, and now we're focusing specifically on small planets that we think are terrestrial. So I think, I guess the main connection to the movie uh, and in my field is that the, the exploration of the solar system and in particular of Mars will greatly advance our understanding of the formation of, you know, rocky planets and, and, and terrestrial exoplanets. Um, so, you know, when I think about the Mars, uh, about the Martian, um, it's hard to, to, to say what my favorite part of it was because everything was so beautiful. Uh, there's so much, you know, everything is, beautiful from the the visual effects to to the cast to the wonderfully accurate science all throughout the film um so it's really it's it's a film in which the the protagonist has to survive using science and using his own ingenuity to solve real complicated uh scientific problems and so it's really a celebration of of science of the power of science and the beauty of, of science. And so that, that was one of the most beautiful things I found. And the fact that there's so much diverse science too, you know, there's physics, uh, chemistry, botany, uh, there's just so many exciting things. And I, I, I also want to add that besides the actual science, you know, in terms of the other aspects of the film, which are not super realistic, if you think about it, but I would say is how um, the, the atmosphere of optimism throughout the movie, you know, because if you think about it, it's, it's a kind of a tragic situation that our, our protagonist is in. 
And despite, you know, even when things go very catastrophically wrong, there's still so much humor and so much optimism throughout the movie. And I, and I really, really appreciated that. As did I, thank you so much. Awesome. And so next we have Dr. Peter Ling. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Peter Ling. Um, I'm uh, with Ohio State University. I work in the Department of Food, Agriculture, and Biological Engineering Department. And I have um, some agriculture background and engineering background. So I call myself a horticulture engineer. Uh, I do research and I do extension. Uh, extension means I work with growers in commercial greenhouses, uh, in plant factory, in vertical farm, uh, in, in a lot of production environments. Uh, I also have been involved with, with NASA for space uh, program for probably 30 years, uh, working on different things. Um, most recently, uh, we, we work on, based on the concept of uh, bio-regenerative life support system. So basically it's using plants as a key component in the life support system. Uh, plants provide oxygen, uh, potable uh, water, and also uh, uh, handles as carbon dioxide, uh, and it also can uh, treat uh, the human waste and recycle that become a resource. So that's what, what we are excited about. And for the past, probably seven, eight years, we have been working on uh, XHAP, which is undergrad undergrad uh, uh, research program. We have our capstone design teams working on different projects, uh, different years, but it's all related to um, space vehicles, how to produce food uh, for, for the astronaut, either for psychological benefits or for, for nutrition or, or those kind of things. It, it, it's a lot of fun when, when, when we uh, go to visit Kennedy Space Center and a student get excited, I'm excited. So um, for, for Martian, uh, the movie, I'm not really a movie goer. And one night my wife dragged me to the theater. <laughs> what are we going on, you know, going to see here? I, I know all the sci-fi sci movies that are not true, but I, I went in there, I really enjoyed the movie, um, especially the, when people well, people tell me you, you, you can, your, your, your um, leisure time is, is to watch corn grow. I, I don't believe it. But in the movie, when you see the potato grow, everybody get excited. So I said, okay, that, that, that'll be it. So that, that's, that's a highlight for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, I am going to go jump into some questions here. Uh, and the first one I have uh, is about those potatoes. Uh, so, and I actually have some attendees asking this as well. Uh, so I never thought I'd say this, but I'm glad, Dr. Ling, that you mentioned human waste because that's the only thing he uses to grow these potatoes. And we have to know, is that realistic? Could someone just grow on Martian soil potatoes using only the tools he had? Or is that a stretch of, of movie magic? Uh, look at the com composition of the feces. Um, not quite complete, but you need to add urine into it. <laughs> okay, so he could have if he had even more uh, more uncomfortable business to, to do his plant plant growth. Well, yes, but also that depends on the diet. Uh, the major nutrient requirement: uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, you, you you can get that from from your your human normal waste, uh, but for, for micronutrients, for, for example, magnesium, manganese, and, and sulfur, those kind of things, uh, really it's not there unless you take more, uh, more almond or spinach or cashew, those kind of things, then you make it up, you have a little more magnesium available to the plant. So mm. uh, I, I think in that diet design, you can probably figure that in, make sure that the uh, uh, micronutrients in there as well. So uh, nutrient-wise, it, it, it's not a problem. Uh, but uh, we are concerned about heavy metals in, in, in the Martian soil. Some plants, they do pick them up and some don't. Uh, when we do phytoremediation, uh, that means using plants to 
soak up uh, heavy metals to clean, uh, to clean out uh, certain sites. So plants do accumulate heavy metals. You, you just want to make sure uh, you, you, your, your plants don't do that. Um, so nutritional wise, it's not a concern, but there's a lot of challenge on, on the uh, lighting side and, and on the thermal control side. I'll probably cover this a little later. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so on that topic, uh, to, to make this happen, another huge obstacle he has to overcome is essentially making water. And so the movie kind of launches into this complex explanation of that. Uh, and this is a question for any of the panelists. Can anyone tell us, is that realistic? Is that something that one could feasibly achieve in the way it's portrayed uh, as done in the film? Are you asking me? Uh, if you go for it, yeah. Any, anyone who, who would like to chime in on that, I know it's sort of a, a specific question, but it's one that comes up because it's it's vital to his survival. Is this ingenious thing he does to to make water? And uh, I, I think viewers would like to know: is that really possible? Well, fossil fuel uh, uh, add oxygen. Your combustion, your your byproduct is is carbon dioxide in the water. Mm -hmm. In commercial greenhouses, actually, we have similar kind of situation. We use, they call it a direct fire heater. Then, then you basically keep the heater in the greenhouse, then it generates heat. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, growers want. But unfortunately, in our cases, uh, also generate water. But in this case, for, for that particular environment, if they want water, combustion byproduct is water. So it is uh, quite reasonable to me. Awesome. That's really cool to hear that that aspect is possible. Can I comment on that too, Anna, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, in my, I, I've done a crash course on um, Martian soils in the last couple of days, and <laughs> it, I found some interesting facts that um, there's, there's some data that suggests that maybe in the top meter of most Martian soils, there may be as much as 14% water. Now that water is tied up in hydrous minerals. It's tied up in salts, like magnesium sulfate, calcium sulfate, maybe iron sulfates as well. So that water is not readily available in the liquid form, but it's there. So with the addition of water to these salts, you may actually add what some water from the soils that's tied up in the salts in, in, into the soil system. So um, I think Peter in, is right that most of it would have to come from, from uh, the, the methods that, that he used in the film, but there is water uh, available if you can dissolve the salts in the soils. That's so fascinating, thank you. And, and while I have you, Barry, I did get another question that I think is geared more towards you from, uh, from David Weinberg who asks, could you say more about the similarities and differences between the Antarctic landscape and the Martian landscape? In the movie, it looks more like Arizona or Utah as, <laughs> as with any images. So could you talk a little bit more about those similarities and differences based on your work uh, with Antarctica? Yeah, I, I can only, again, relate to to you all what I know from my colleagues who s study Martian geomorphology. Uh, I have a good colleague named Jim Head who's at Brown University who's done a lot of work on Martian geomorphology and he's worked in Antarctica as well, he and his students. And so there's a lot of similarity of process. It's a cold, dry place, Antarctica. It's not as cold or dry as Mars, but many of the processes, whether they be wind, whether they be glacier, whether they be uh, permafrost that we see in Antarctica that controls the surface of the, of the, of the landscape are the ones that have worked in, uh, Mar on Mars for much, much longer periods of time. So there are similarities in, in, in the geomorphology and the, and the earth process that goes on there. Amazing, thank you. Uh, another really popular question I'm seeing in our chat here is uh, folks want to talk about this radiation issue. So as we know, the Martian atmosphere is much different. Um, so perhaps Barry or Romy, can one of you comment on the fact that he doesn't die from the radiation? How, how plausible is that? Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what would that really look like for to have a human being living on Mars for that extended period of time? Yeah, I, I can comment on that a little bit. So. 
I mean, yes, uh, on Mars, the problem with Mars is that the atmosphere is a lot, lot thinner than in, on Earth, right? It's something like 200 times less dense. And so all we don't have that. And also um, Mars doesn't have a magnetosphere like Earth that can protect us from harmful radiation from the sun, you know, from solar, from the solar wind or, or cosmic rays. And so th there is that problem, right? And so right now, um, I know that NASA and other uh, space agencies are working on this problem of uh, space radiation. As far as I know, I don't think there's there's a solution to it now. And I think that's why probably like in the movie, they sort of don't mention it. Um, there's there's really no mention of it. You know, he he cha he um, faces a lot of challenges and that's a really big one, but it's not something that he can solve. Um, but I, the, the other thing is that the movie doesn't say, I mean, we don't know how far into the future this happens. And it could be that, you know, by then we will have solved the radiation problem. But, um, but yes, it's, it's a real problem. And that part is not very realistic just because we don't have a solution to it right now. Right. I noticed at one point towards the end of the film, they show him um, his, how his body is totally changed and he's, you know, really bruised and his skin looks really unwell. Could that potentially be because of the radiation? Do you think that's one way they're trying to, to acknowledge it? Uh, is, that, is that a possibility? I think so. It, I wasn't, I was also a bit confused when I saw that, like it's, he, he also appeared like very, very thin, but that was because he was rationing his food. But then the bruises, I wasn't sure why that. So it, it could be from the radiation. I think I would guess that, you know, prolonged exposure to, to harmful radiation would cause other things like an increased likelihood of getting cancer or something like that. But it could right. also like physically burn you and by the way like the other thing that they don't really address in the movie is like if if there was a solar flare happening like he would have it probably would have been game over for him right. so a lot of things had to go right so i'm, I'm glad you mentioned the solar flare because i want to transition to talking about the weather because what kicks this all off is this this wild unpredicted storm on mars so how likely is that, that you could just have this hugely destructive storm? Because that seems like it would pose a massive issue to real life future missions if NASA has to deal with that. So does Martian weather uh, get depicted in an accurate way within this film? Yeah, I can also comment on that a little bit. So I think that's actually one of the arguably weakest scientific points of the movie in that it's not totally accurate there so we have seen we know from previous missions to mars from rovers that are there that there is some sort of space weather like we've registered you know some winds of something like 150 kilometers per hour and on earth you know that's comparable to a hurricane a category one hurricane so that would seem pretty intense except that on mars again because the atmosphere is so thin and there's a lot less pressure than the the that sort of wind like there are sandstorms but they wouldn't cause the damage that we see depicted in the movie like we wouldn't see the the sandstorms like picking up these like heavy rocks or heavy particles uh they would really cause no damage like you we wouldn't see matt damon flying through the <laughs> atmosphere okay. like in a in a tornado on earth that's really good to know. I mean, that's, that's great to hear in terms of human, real life humanity's future of space exploration that we have actually, it's not quite as dramatic perhaps as that, that aspect shows it. I'm so I will say what is actually accurate that I, I really loved seeing was the, the devil uh, twist, twisters or little tornadoes like you can see it in some parts of the movie and those are actually real. Like they have been captured by other missions and as well as lightning. So Mars has actually a little bit of weather, you know. Wow, so the, the lightning they show in the movie, that, that really does happen on Mars. Yeah, those things happen actually quite frequently. And these, these little twisters that we see, um, I, yeah, it was very like uh, in passing, but so fascinating to see. So that's just one of the natural things that, that we've seen happening with the, the regular Martian weather. 
Amazing. Absolutely. Wow. So kind of switching back years uh, to talk a little bit more about the food side of things, uh, Dr. Ling, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your opinion of the way they depict his, his growing. Um, just as someone who researches how to grow food off of Earth, how does the movie's portrayal of this compare with the real world solutions that you know are currently being worked on? Okay, um, there's a lot of problem with growing uh, crop on, on Mars. Okay, I, I mentioned nutritionally uh, should be okay, but for environmental control, uh, radiation is totally going to kill those plants. Uh, there, there's no other option that you have to grow them underground. Otherwise, radiation level it, it just won't won't happen there. Hmm. And secondly, uh, look at the temperature. Uh, Mars temperature is, is uh, cooler than than Earth. I think that average temperature is somewhere around 55 degree Fahrenheit, something like that. That's the during summertime. At nighttime, you probably drop it down to minus 80 or some, something like that. Uh, with a system or, or with a single, almost like single poly kind of, kind of shutter, uh, I, I don't think that they have enough heating to, to keep it warm enough for the, for the potato to survive there. Mm. And the biggest issue is actually lighting. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think that the, the top of the growing chamber is, is transparent. So where are you going to get light? Uh, and for uh, plant factory, uh, that is the number one cost for for that. Okay. So uh, there are a few scientific uh, inadequacy. Let, let me call that in, in the movie, but probably you know not enough time to cover all, all the details. Uh, for for real world um, solutions, uh, NASA has worked on this for for many 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 years, and the, the one one thing excite them the most is, is that uh, it, it is a bioregenerative life support system. Uh, for an area of about two hundred square foot, you can generate enough oxygen for one astronaut. For four astronauts on the water supply side. On the food side, you can uh, grow at about 55% uh, to meet the, the need. Uh, then also, you, you can, you can uh, maintain the CO2 level so you don't get suffocated with a high CO2 concentration. And again, the, um, the gray water, or, or I should say, a human waste that can be absorbed and, and polished actually using plants become part of water. So, so that's how important that, that is. And um, what's shown in, in the Martian actually, it, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, fundamental. Uh, NASA folks and, and a, 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 lot of, a lot of people, a lot of researchers, they have advanced on this and basically they're looking at a resource optimization, uh, looking at uh, energy, uh, looking at the labor issue, uh, look at um, space utilization issue, uh, and and the, the one terminology, I, I don't know if the, the audience tonight familiar with is equivalent system mass. Basically, each pound of the payload you launch into the space, you need to have a certain performance. You need to be, be there to, to do something. And that is tightly controlled. So if you launch a uh, plant production unit, you need to justify what that unit the mass of volume is going to do. So you have to look at it, how much oxygen you can generate, how much water you can generate, how much biomass you can generate, how, how well you can handle the waste. So it, it is, it is uh, very, very advanced uh, in, in, in the research area. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to answer more specific questions from the audience if they have. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll let you know as those come in. We have, as you were speaking, did get a couple questions on, on soil. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Lyons, if you want to chime in on, on this front, uh, we have one attendee asks, what, uh, with the type of soil on Mars, uh, would the warming and movement of this possibly be a health concern to, to the astronaut? Uh, thinking about how he didn't wear his full spacesuit when he's in his greenhouse, does that, does that strike you as an, an issue within the film? Um, probably not within the greenhouse, but again, what I've been reading about Martian soils, it's, a lot of it's very, very fine grained. 
And as Romy was pointing out that we, we, they get these windstorms, some of them last for weeks on end. And I would think the potential of inhaling um, soil, but I guess he's gonna have his helmet on outside. So maybe that's not an issue. So, so inside the greenhouse, I, I doubt that there, there would be health issues related to the soil per se. I, I think the real issues have been pointed out have been radiation and things like that on the, when they're right. out, outside. And so from a geochemistry perspective, I'm wondering if you can tell the audience a little bit more about first, what is geochemistry and how <laughs> does that, <laughs> I think we should start there. <laughs> and uh, how does that relate to, to studying the, the non-geo, non-earth planets? Is there, is there a sister field that, you know, people work in when we're talking about studying the chemistry of non-earth planets or does it really all fall under this, this joint category of geochemistry? Well, that's a really good question. And, and, and I think geochemistry would be the, the top header. And the, the term is obviously a combination of geo, meaning earth, and chemistry. So really, it's the application of chemistry, um, both chemical principles, chemical theory, making analytical chemical measurements, uh, making observations by whatever means to understand the distribution of elements and isotopes and compounds, um, both on this planet and on other planets as well. Uh, under that big uh, umbrella of geochemistry would be something called cosmochemistry, which is the chemistry of the cosmos. And so uh, there are people using, it, probably in your department, uh, using various techniques to look at what, what stars are made of and what planets or what compositions uh, other planets have. And of course, if we can get our hands on the material uh, and bring it back to Earth and analyze it directly, we're going to get more information perhaps ab uh, and about things like isotopes. But yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's basically uh, the study of the chemistry of, of everything from, um, from water to ice to solid earth to uh, planets and stars. I would lump under uh, the term. I hope that's, that answers the question. It does. Yes, that's, that's really enlightening. Thank you so much. Sure. I do have another one here uh, from Lisa who asks, would it be possible to use the lunar gateway as a vertical garden center using waste and urine from the astronauts uh, and a point center uh, for supply chain, supply chain command of food and water to Mars? Um, so uh, Peter, I know you mentioned vertical garden, so I'm, I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah, gateway module uh, at this time, NASA, it, it, well, Blackwater uh, is, is uh, forbidden at this time. Blackwater basically feces. Uh, gray water is in consideration and they're doing some testing on that. Uh, gray water means urine and, and a laundry water, uh, th th those kind of things. Uh, those are good resources. Um, and vertical garden, well, Gateway at, at this time actually is serving uh, more like a, a gas station to, to Moon. Uh, astronaut, they can go there for short-term visit and they can uh, control the ground activity from, from the gateway, uh, but it's not a long-term uh, post at this time. Uh, more and more than likely, the astronaut just go there for a few months, they, they go home, then your next mission, you come in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, vertical garden uh, is being proposed. Uh, for, for fresh uh, produce, uh, when astronauts get there, they actually get some, get some uh, fresh produce there. But at this time, I would say that it's mostly used for research. You look at how plants respond in, in that environment. Uh, and because the gateway is really close to the Earth, you can really supply 100% uh, food w without worrying about sustainability. Um, so, I think that currently that, that's a second, secondary uh, objective. But yes, if you want to do vertical growing, that is a space you can use it. And I would love to, to get astronauts excited and feel welcome when they go in, they see fresh lettuce in there and, and, and arugula there, you know, just ready to go. 
That would be amazing. And so I know you mentioned too that you work on this with undergraduates through through something called the NASA X Hat Project. So I was wondering if you could take a moment just to tell us a little bit more about what some of these solutions look like. So you're working with your student your student teams to to develop these ideas for for growing food off Earth. What are some of the leading ways that that we're doing this now, and and how that could apply to, to Mars in the future? Okay, when, uh, when we start a project every year, I, I told them, I said, well, the thing about this is a dual purpose project. Uh, your, your trap inside of a space vehicle is, is not that different from your trap inside your dorm. Mm -hmm. Living quarter is about the same size. You probably also want to have some plants in your dorm. Um, the astronaut, they want to have some living things around them. So once you develop a, a growing unit for space, you can have that in your dorm. And I encourage them that you think about uh, maybe you can market this idea. Whatever you come up with, uh, you apply to the space situation as well as, as, as on Earth. A um, few things we, we, we look at it. The uh, first thing is, is that uh, it's a plant health monitoring system. I remind them, I say, well, if you step out of your building, you see every, everywhere green, especially in Ohio, uh, you don't appreciate a single plant. But if you look at them as a biological or as a, a bioregenerative life support component, then every plant matters. So you better make sure they are healthy, they, they, are, they are doing what they're supposed to do, and you can control them for different objectives. If you need water, you can crank them up to pump up more water, but at the same time, you're going to probably uh, sacrifice growth. So if you look at your oxygen levels low, okay, you, you can crank up the oxygen generation machine, but again, you have to sacrifice others. So there's a lot of things, objectives that based the driven uh, actions that, that they, they can take. So it applied while well, I have students that start working with the uh, um, vertical farm and they just love them. They say, wow, this is you know, just like in you know, enclosed space. Uh, this could be an articut, or this could be a, a space shuttle, or this could be in Gateway. Uh, this just happened in Cincinnati, but, but it, it's the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. That's really fascinating. I do have a question here for Romy. Uh, one of our attendees, Rachel, asks, uh, when do you think will be the first human footprints on Mars? When do you think those will be made? Um, I, that's an interesting question. I don't think everyone knows the exact answer. Um, but I would say somewhere between, like, the plans are for, to put humans on Mars in like 2030s, you know, or in the, in the thirties. So we're, I think we're closer than we think. Right. Thank you. And while I have you, our resident astrophysicist on deck, uh, we do have a couple questions about the gravitational slingshot that we see towards the end of the movie. So we have this character, Rich Purnell, played by Donald Glover, who comes in from the astrodynamics team, uh, basically proposing that we use the Earth to get a gravitational slingshot to go back to Mars and rescue Mark. Uh, in your opinion, how realistic is that portrayal? So gravitational assists are real so that that part is realistic and that the maneuver that they propose makes sense um the the part that's not super realistic is like when you were sending probes to mars or you know from mars earth um you need to send them uh in a specific time window when uh mars and earth and Earth are in a specific position relative to each other um, because you want to minimize the distance between them. So if you decide, like if you're traveling from Mars to Earth and you, you want to decide that you decide that instead of just landing on earth you want to you know just use the gravity the, the Earth's gravity to slingshot back to Mars, then by the time that you were traveling there the the position between like mars and earth will have changed and so they'll it's it's unlikely that they'll have the correct planetary alignment so i think that could happen it's just mars and earth align very infrequently and so you know it could happen it's just it's very lucky for that to happen 
Right. And I think another complication one of our question askers mentions, uh, Tom asks about the tearing of the tarp air shield during the MAV takeoff. Um, put the MAV at 68 kilometers too low. How much would that change the slingshot around Mars and affect the return trip to Earth? Essentially, when we see this, one of the things that happens is this, that we have this tearing of the, the shield. Would that, be, would that be something that would be affecting this, you know, this slingshot plan? Yeah, well, I think that the whole reason why they did that, I, I thought was to um, make it so that he can uh, ascend even higher, right? And, but then at the end, like, that wasn't even enough, and so they had to do a, a lot of other maneuvers to try to, to, to catch up with him and grab him. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't know how realistic it is. Like, I don't know if an actual, <laughs> um, like, Mars Ascent vehicle would survive you know, the, the atmosphere was just like a tarp, um, but. And I see in our, in our comments, actually, uh, one of our astronomy professors, David Weinberg, just shed some additional light on that too. So I encourage folks to, to read the, the chat happening there. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the, the catching of him because uh, I was talking, I was watching this last night with, with a family member and, and they said, why don't they get a net? Why don't they get just something much, much bigger to catch this poor man than their beefy astronaut gloves? And that for me was, I think the, for me, the most unrealistic part was like just having to grasp each other's hands. <laughs> I thought it was so um, very like Hollywood dramatic, um, which does leave me- Unnecessarily into dramatic in my opinion. Right. <laughs> But well, that does lead me into another question that I, I, I'd like to ask all of our panelists, which is, in your opinion, what was the most realistic and least realistic aspects of the film? Uh, so this was asked by Rachel, uh, and I think it'd be great to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, so if we want to start uh, with Dr. Lyons, uh, I'd love to, to kind of hear everybody's opinions on what was done most realistically versus re least realistically. Oh, uh, wow. That's... Um hard one <laughs> that's a very hard question I and you know, I, and I'm not sure I'm the the right person to ask it to uh, again I, I thought that um, that he I mean the storyline I, I you wonder how many people put in that situation of course he's been being trained as an astronaut for probably most of his adult life but would have even uh, made an attempt to just stay alive without knowing that anybody knew he was alive. So uh, I, I see that as, as obviously the, the, the nuance, I mean, the, the, the obvious um, major threat of the film, but um, whether that would actually have happened for most of us, I'm not sure. So, I, I, so I, I'll stay away from the, the science and, and say something about the psychology, I guess. Right. Thank you. Romy, how about you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, and I also, I want to add that, like, I, I thought also it was very unrealistic, the whole, I mean, his, he's trapped on Mars and he's, he's by himself. And like, I don't know if like humans can actually have that sort of like, resilience that that determination to live like and you know and watching this film also in in 2020 hit differently right because like we're going through you know through a pandemic and we're forced to stay at home and you know we can sort of sympathize with the character and that we're starting to feel like that isolation and how that affects us mentally and i don't I don't know that that people would actually react in the way that he did to all the challenges. And then for so long, like he spends, you know, like a year and a half on Mars and, and so many things have to go right for him to survive and, and everything goes, goes right. Like, so that part I think is not very realistic, but then from the point of view of the science, like there's a lot of accurate science. I particularly really liked when he, he remembers the site where Pathfinder was buried and he goes and grabs it and he makes it operational again. And right. he sets up like this very rudimentary two way communication system with earth. And that's really like what saves him is like, he's able to establish communication with earth. My and that, Pathfinder. 
<laughs> and and that part is 100% real like and the ingenuity of using hexadecimals because he can't like if he uses the whole alphabet like it'll the the angle between each character will be too small so he won't know where the camera is pointing so i thought that was that was really clever and, and really nice um thank you thanks so much dr lane okay i'm gonna stay on, on this production side of the thing <laughs> The most realistic thing is that he was hungry. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I was disappointed and, and saw him try to harvest potatoes when the green, when the plant's still green. Uh, because you, you don't do that. You want to accumulate more starch in, in, in the tuber. So you want to wait until it's kind of welded and it get brown before you, you pick them up. Um, but as, as we are in, in education here, um, I was very impressed that he can pick up the manual and say, well, I, he, I'm now a botanist. Okay, right. all the wrong, it shouldn't be a botanist, it should be a horticulturist or something, because botanists, they, I don't think they, they produce food, but they are solar studies. Uh, it, it is a live learning. Uh, I, I think what we're doing in, in, in education is, is to help student to learn how to learn. Uh, when you are in those situations, you, if you're given a manual, you should be able to follow it based on your fundamental uh, training. So that, you know, I, I really enjoy that part. Thank you. And since you did mention the kind of food side of things again, I thought I'd, I'd throw it to a question from one of our attendees, Austin, who asks, uh, perchlorates have been cited as a potential hazard for using Martian soil to grow cloth crops. I have heard that getting rid of the perchlorates would be as simple as washing the soil with water. Is that accurate or would the process have to be more complicated than this? I, I would say it's probably a little, little more than that because uh, those really really bound it with, with, with the uh, soil particle. Um, actually, um, I recently read a paper um, and Saying that some plants that they, they actually they, they they don't pick up those heavy metals. Hmm. So by choosing the, the right plants, you don't have to worry about that. Oh wow! What are the right plants, and are potatoes one of them? Um, I think well, I need to go back my reference. I don't want to mislead you, but th there's choices. <laughs> and I do see. Yeah, one of our attendees also asks. Uh, if we brought plants to Mars, what kind of plant could go if we come with it, uh, depending on the Martian soil? So are there any plants that stick out to you as particularly, you know, good choices um, for, yeah. uh, for harvesting food? Well, the current uh, NASA uh, veggie system, uh, especially the veggie pillow, they, they use a, uh, the, the kind of small pillow, I would say probably around six inch by six inch. The inside is really, uh, they call it a arcelite. Arcelite is, is those material you see on, on the, uh, on the track, track field. You see a little, 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 maybe red soil kind of particle because they, they don't cling to the cleats and they drain very well. Those are totally inorganic. And those are actually very similar to, well, somewhat similar to Martian soil, I, I, I would put it that way. So, so actually, I, I think the Martian soil should be able to grow a lot of different plants. Um, mm. And NASA, they, they, they did study, a uh, thorough study on growing uh, stable crops, uh, potato, wheat. Uh, they even tried uh, peanuts because it's, it can uh, used to for food and, and also for oil or for energy source. Um, then, then for, for uh, vegetable, for salad crops, that's more, more for psychological benefits. Uh, recently, they even uh, grew some flowers. So oh. it, with that soil, uh, using hydroponic method, uh, I, I think you can grow a lot, a lot of di different crops. It, it's just a matter of uh, how effective in, in meeting the, the needs. 
Yeah. There's a wide, wide, uh, wide range of choices. And, and actually, um, NASA researchers, they, they are looking at different crops and they see which uh, perform the, the best. Um, for example, I look at tomato plants, but they are not looking at a vine crop very tall. They are looking at a miniature dwarf tomato and miniature uh, pepper, even, uh, oh, the, 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 the most uh, popular ones will, will be herbs. Mm. Right. Right. Those, those kind of things. Thank you. And as you're speaking, uh, another question asker wants to know what would happen if you introduced earthworms to the Martian soil? Could that help uh, making it viable or would your would worms just instantly perish? <laughs> Interestingly, I, I, I came across another article. They, they comment on Martian soil is, is kind of sharp. Then they worry about whether the, the, the sharpness would, would damage the root system or damage earthworm, mm. oh, it, it didn't matter. It, it didn't hurt them. So earthworm would, would be just fine. It but, would be fine. Wow. That's fascinating. But, but you, you got to have organic material in there to keep them alive, though. Right. Not survive with inorganic uh, only, particles only. That's so fascinating. I would never have thought to, to, to suggest bringing up earthworms, but who knows? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> uh, our so next worm testing is an excellent organic fertilizer. Right, right. <laughs> I, uh, I have a question here for Romy. Uh, one of our attendees asks you, do you think the HAB is something that's really achievable on Mars? Uh, how realistic was this portrayal of Mark's habitat? So I, th I think it's realistic in that if we, are, if we manage to establish colonies on on Mars, then we're going to need some sort of you know habitat. And so, and I I know that there are space agencies that are already like NASA and SpaceX are already working on on habitats. Um, and so yeah, so I think they're they're realistic and and they're going to be the future. And looking towards the future, we have an, another question here from Emily, who asks, similar to this gateway idea with the moon, what if we used Martian moons as stepping stones to Mars? Is that an idea that's currently being explored? Uh, or is that something that sounds like a feasible concept to, to any of the panelists? So she asks, if you used these moons as a, a stepping stone, similar to the gateway station for the moon. I am more familiar with gateway for, for the moon. I, I'm not that familiar with, with the moon for, for Mars. Um, there are different purposes of having a gateway because as I mentioned earlier, that um, is for, for experiment on, on board and also to control ground activities and also as, as a launch pad uh, for deeper space. That, that, that's what, what it's used for. Um, I, I can't answer on, on, the, on the, the question about the moon of, of Mars. Well, it seems to me like the lunar gateway is something that's so valuable because it's, it's so close and can help us go further. But when we're talking about a Martian moon, that's about the same relatively the same distance from us as, as Mars itself is. So I'm, I'd be curious to, to you know, to, to know what the real advantages of that would be since it's not really a closer stepping stone, so to speak. Um, but yeah. Well the, the, well, the delay time will be much shorter. Communication delay time, that, that's a huge benefit uh, for sure. Right. Uh, other than that, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I'm going to switch to another question because I'm very excited about it. They mentioned tardigrades, which are, uh, I think, the creepiest but also coolest animal. Um, if you haven't heard of this, just do a quick Google. Uh, they're very strange. Um, and this question asker mentions that they've read about research about tardigrades and their resilience to ionizing radiation. Is there any other organism that similarly shows this resistance and naturally provides for the plants in a co way of coexisting? 
Um, so, and another, the reason I think tardigrades are really cool is that this is one of those things where they've sent them out into space and they live and they're just really, yeah, can persevere, uh, similar to how our, our protagonist persevered. Uh, so, uh, uh, maybe Romy, would you like to, to field this one about, uh, you know, do you know of any other organisms that show this resistance or, or Dr. Ling, you look like you, you, you know, have, have a thought on that as well. Any, any ideas there? I, this is more like into the territory of astrobiology, so I don't know that much, but I've, I've def, so I've heard of these like kinds of creatures that are called, we call them extremophiles because they love extreme environments. Obviously that's a, that's a subjective thing, I guess, like they would see us as being the extremophiles, but these, these um, little organisms can survive in like very extreme conditions. So like with very little sunlight or some of them, right? Or there are some that are like, um, they, I don't remember the word, but they, they thrive in very acidic environments or where there are high concentrations of salt. I, so definitely there, are, and that's why we are hopeful that we may discover life in, in the solar system. Um, you know, maybe like in a, beneath some like icy moon and some underground like ocean, Lake, so um, there, there are others besides the tardigrade. I just don't know their name, but I know that there's, you know, they're a whole class of um, microbes. Right. I think it's very interesting for folks to to learn more about. And I also did want to mention uh, and give quick thank thanks to to David, who mentions in the comments here that if you do want to learn more about this, as as most know, this is based on a, a novel. So you can actually read the the original book, The Martian, for those who just want to delve further into this, um, who are looking for some interesting discussions on botany and physics. Um, so that's something I definitely recommend for anyone who wants to continue on uh, to continue the conversation past past today. Um, so another question here uh, from our askers. Uh, let me scroll up here to to find to find a new one. Um, uh, so Emily uh, asks about the atmosphere. Romy, you mentioned earlier on in the discussion that it's not quite as harsh as shown in the movie, or rather, the weather isn't quite as harsh. So Emily asks, how different would Mark Watney's launch off of Mars really look? Um, considering the fact that the actual Martian atmosphere and weather isn't particularly the most realistic part of the film. So, so is the question like, what would it look on Mars or what would it look here? I think she's wondering how would that affect his launch? So what would it look like in real life for someone to be launching off of Mars to try to head home? How would that affect the, the departure? Well, actually, I'm not very sure about this. Um, the surface gravity is less. So um, it's like 40% the, the surface gravity on, on Earth. So I would guess that it would make it easier. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we do have another question here from Charlotte who mentioned something I really liked about the movie, which was the global cooperation. Uh, and so uh, Charlotte mentions that if this colonization of Mars is a feasible concept, do you believe that the global cooperation as shown in the film when China helps NASA uh, would really happen? Or is this merely a hopeful idea? Um, so Barry, would you like to chime in on your thoughts on this topic? I would love to chime in on that one because Antarctica is the only place on the planet where uh, we have a treaty signed by, uh, I think, close to 45 s s signatory nations. Now that may be a little high. And uh, the Antarctic Treaty um, sets aside Antarctica for non-military purposes. And, and in order to be a signatory of the treaty, you have to have a science program on Antarctica. And there's something called SCAR, which is the Scientific Committee for Antarctic research, which is really, the, for all intents and purposes, is the science arm of the treaty. And uh, it's a place where there is cooperation between the scientists of the world and a lot of interaction uh, between many, many nations. So I, I think the, the Antarctic Treaty would, would be a good uh, beginning of to think about 
colonization of other planets. And it, it, it could be something that could be uh, drawn on as an example of, of, of how to move forward in, in, in this regard. That is so fascinating and something that had not occurred to me, using Antarctica as basically a model for what this could look like for other planets. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, thank you. That's really if, fascinating. If, if, if I could go back to you, you, the question you asked, Romy, about the tardigrades. Yes. Um, in, in Antarctica, in the Antarctic soils, we have uh, tardigrades, but we also have nematode worms, the same nematode worms I'm sure Peter hates for, for eating the roots of his, of his <laughs> crops. But th 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 these worms, there's, I think there are three species, and they have the ability to, to go into an, um, anhydrobiosis. So during the dry, cold winter, they exclude all the water from their cells and can stay in stasis for long periods of time. But even there, there are limits to what their tolerance is in terms of how much salt is in the soil. So I, I think that um, these organisms are, are very much ex extremophiles, as, as Romy said. And, but there are even limits to what they are able to t tolerate. So, uh, and again, this goes back to what I said earlier, wh wh why places in Antarctica have been really thought about in terms of thinking about uh, biological processes that might have taken place or are taking place in Mars. Amazing, thank you. Do you know of uh, any, uh, you know, habitat recreations on Antarctica? So for example, you know, we sometimes have habitats people design for simulations of missions. Is that something that you've seen take place in Antarctica in terms of research that would help kind of recreate the experience of one living on Mars? Um, I'm not sure there's been any on Antarctica. As, as you, you, you all are probably aware, there have been ones in Canada and Utah and other places. Right. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I don't, I can't recall of any of one being established there. I think the, 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 the scientific facilities in Antarctica have been established to do uh, science in Antarctica. But on the other hand, as I keep saying, the analogy is 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 made to other uh, non-Earth systems as well. Right, and I think it makes a lot of sense because I can't think of a an Earth system that is more like a non-Earth system than Antarctica. That seems to me like the most otherworldly thing we have access to. Yeah, and then, you know, it's like Romy also mentioned this idea of these ice-covered planets with oceans we think underneath them. And there's good analogy in Antarctica to that as well in these subglacial lake systems that maybe um, Lake Vostok, which is the largest one in Antarctica, may have had ice on top of it now for, I don't know what the latest estimate is, but maybe 20 million years. And, wow. and so um, th there are other things besides the soils that have uh, um, solar system analogies. Amazing. Thank you. I am sorry to say that we are coming to the end of our hour. I see we have so many wonderful questions still, but I want to respect the time of our panelists and our interpreter and our captioner. So I am going to go ahead and bring things to a close. Uh, before I do, I have one very important question for all of our panelists today, which is, do you want to go to Mars? And if so, why? And if not, tell, tell me why too. So uh, think about it for a moment. Are you, are you signing up for a Martian trip? Does that sound good to you? And uh, to start things off, I'll, I'll go to Romy first. Um, I am all for the exploration of Mars, but I am not signing up for a mission. <laughs> I'm afraid of airplanes, so you, you can just scared. imagine. <laughs> Very fair. I respect that. I like that you can study it from here uh, and contribute to it while having your feet on the ground. Yes, from the safety of my home. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, how about you? Um, I would go to Moon, but Mars is a little too far out. You're talking about three years round trip, um, I prefer a shorter route. <laughs> That's fair. I think the moon feels more comfortable for me as well. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. And last not, but not least, Barry, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with my colleagues that I think it's worth doing. I, 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 but uh, I, 
I know you can't see me very well because I'm in the shadows, but I'm way too old to be going to Mars. It, it, it's for a younger person. So even though I think it's a, it, I wish I was going to be around that when it happens, but, I, I, but I'm, I'm not going to go myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you all so much for helping us learn about it while still here on Earth and for having this fascinating discussion. I know I learned a lot and I hope our attendees did too. Uh, it is nine o'clock, so we're going to sign off. Uh, before I do, I do want to encourage everyone to join us next month. We'll be hosting a panel all about Star Wars. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested in talking about the science behind the Star Wars universe, uh, please be sure to stay tuned and to come back to our next monthly movie night event. And I look forward to, to seeing you all then. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, to our interpreter and our captioners who are working on a, a difficult conversation, one that is not easy to interpret for sure. <laughs> and uh, thank you to our tech support as well for making sure today's conversation went smoothly. So I hope you all have a great rest of your evening and I hope to see you next month. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.